Now we put out uh, Graham's bio with the invite, and many of you will know him, but he's had a long and distinguished career across the energy sector, so not just in gas, but uh, also in electricity. Uh, and he's an international expert in the economics of gas and, and electricity. He's affiliated still with NERA, uh, he, so he ran their London office for many years. Um, and he was notably involved in the early days of the UK reforms right across the energy sector. So he has a very um, broad experience across things like network regulation, market rules, contract design and electricity and gas as well. Now the origin of, of this um, presentation is I saw Graham give this in Europe earlier this year and I sat there thinking, gee, I'd love to bring this to New Zealand. He and I had a cup of coffee and he said, I'm coming to New Zealand. Um, and so here we are today and I'm very grateful for, for making time to present this. The only introduction I'm going to make is to say um, this is a little bit more blue skies for us in New Zealand than you normally get in this room. So can I assure those folk who are wondering, um, I ha Ian Wilson's not out the back writing this up into a set of rules we're going to issue tomorrow. <laughs> Um, it's very much a look at the US and Europe and the value for us is to, is to stay very much across what's happening in the world for Gas Industry Co. That's really important. Um, as I say, anybody who thinks that you regulate by copying another jurisdi jurisdiction's regulation needs their head read. There is nobody who should go out and copy another jurisdiction's holus bolus system. But what we should be doing, as someone said recently when we were in, in uh, Europe and Florence, um, learn from each other's successes and failures. Uh, so for me this is a compare and contrast, I think there's a lot in here we'll say, gee, that's not going to be us, it's different, but there's also a bunch of things we can say, gee, we could join in on that and learn from it. Uh, last thing I'll say, I promised is to say, Graham's not an expert on the New Zealand system, so when we first spoke he said, gee, how could I speak to a New Zealand audience, I don't know your system. I said, that's fine, that's not what you're here for. It's very much, let's hear a little bit about what's going on in the world, and we'll do the compare and contrast rather than asking Graham to do it. Uh, with those comments, Graham, thanks very much. We'll, we'll listen with great interest. Fine, thank you, Steve. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'm very grateful actually for the chance to be here, and uh, for all the people who brought me here. It was actually uh, the ACCC that got me here to first to Brisbane to their conference, and I don't know if anyone saw me there, and then from since then, uh, the CCNZ's brought me over to Wellington, but in the meantime, I've been spending a long time changing planes in places like Cairns and the South Island. So I've had a great time while I've been here. Um, it's a bit of a shock to be back, so just you know, bear with me if um, I seem a little countrified going through this. As Steve said, this is a talk that I gave, or actually I've given a couple of times in the Florence School of Regulation. It um, takes place in Italy uh, every summer. And originally it was given by my, by my colleague at NERA, Jeff Matcom, who's based in Boston, and I worked with him very closely over the years. And one year I took it over from him. Um, there are a lot of slides in here which are, include Jeff's own particular view. This is a, this Florence School of Regulation is a school for European regulators, although other people turn up as well, not just non-Europeans, but non-regulators as well. And Jeff always took the opportunity to berate the regulators in Europe for their in general incompetence and, and <coughs> various other vices. Um, I'll probably skip through some of those slides here because they're not really appropriate for you, but they're, um, they're in the pack. They're more lessons about how superior the US is to Europe. I tend to modify that message slightly when I give it in, in Florence. Um, but the general message that Jeff was trying to get across was that as a result of an evolutionary process really. The, the US gas pipeline system has evolved to a point where um, for fundamental economic reasons it operates essentially as a competitive industry. It's a bit odd, especially in Europe, to talk about gas pipelines being a competitive industry because everyone in Europe thinks of it as a monopoly that needs regulation. And in fact there is still a lot of regulation of gas pipelines, but the regulation has been designed to uh, create a commercial framework that preserves competition, even for little uh, uh, adjustments, to little investments in the network. So the whole regime is, is, you can think of it as a regime designed at preserving competition and keeping 
uh, investment decisions, for example, a matter of uh, the choice of the distribution companies who do these kind of things rather than central planning. That's kind of the big message in, for Europeans who just love central planning. So the, that's the contrast I'm going to make. And what I'm going to do is explain to you um, where the differences between America and Europe lie and what it is that makes the European system, uh, sorry, the, what it is that makes the US system so successful in keeping alive the competition in investment for in gas pipelines. Most of the ideas you can find, Jeff actually was so intrigued by putting this together that he actually wrote a whole book about it and you can find it, uh, I'm sure on amazon.co.nz or whatever the equivalent is here. What I'm going to talk about are the three essential topics, mostly focusing on the first one. So this is a, a talk for a European audience primarily, but I'll be describing the, the US system by contrast with the European system. In the second and third points, parts, I'll look at what the consequences are, what that means for the way the systems work. But I think the, the main thing we want to focus on is the first section about how these systems work and what the differences are between Europe and the US. It's going to be like that all the time. I think. No, it's back. The first point is that the, what we're talking about is just a, the all gas industries, and I would imagine even the New Zealand one is pretty similar, in that it's an inland industry that transport gas across, through pipelines across the land. There are gas markets at either end, and, and there are regulators involved in what's going on. So there are a lot of similarities. The differences are, well, um, the first point to make is that although that it's all just pipelines as far as the gas industry is concerned, if anyone is here from an electricity background, we tend to distinguish between electricity networks and gas networks, uh, at least Jeff and I do. In Europe, they're all regarded as equivalent, really, They're just energy networks and treated as natural monopolies the same way. But in the US, for example, uh, electricity is regulated in a quite different way from gas. And the big difference is gas is pretty slow moving. The capacity in gas pipelines is well understood. When in an electricity network, as if you know some background, it's sort of just about possible to measure the capacity on the network, but it prompts big arguments and it varies all the time and the flows move around in different ways. So there are some differences between electricity and gas. And if you're from an electricity background, put everything you know about networks behind you, and um, except this is a, gas networks have a different kind of underlying technology. The flow paths in particular are very predictable. Gas tends to flow from where it comes out of the ground to where it's used, and it doesn't really change much over the life of a field. With electricity, you've got a hydro system here, so depending on where the rain falls, the power will flow from different places at different times. That's generally not the case with gas. It's a pretty, I, I would say gas is the, it's, it's slightly less boring than the water industry. But <laughs> <laughs> That's because I come from an electricity background. Um, I don't know where, how you, what terms you use to describe it, but this is one of Jeff's main points, that whereas in electricity people talk about a grid, meaning some kind of a meshed network, the gas <coughs> network should not be regarded as a grid. He goes through reports we write and religiously takes out the words grid and network and replaces them with pipeline. Because the pipeline goes from A to B, it is not a network, it's a pipeline from A to B or lots of pipelines from A to B. Um, and you'll see why that's important when we get through to describing how the American system defines capacity and makes contracts for that capacity. So th the key point is that this is a transport system for moving gas from one place to another. It's not a grid that links up multiple sources and, and sort of, uh, integrates them. As far as the actual systems are concerned, when you look at them, they're very similar in US and European systems in many ways. This is um, a map of the American system, and the production is down here in, in the Gulf of Mexico, and there's some comes in from Canada in the Midwest, and it's basically flowing up to markets in the northeast of the U US up here, where it's used for heating as well as generation. So it flows in those directions. Of course, those patterns of flow, well, although they've been fairly well set f since the gas industry started back in the 1930s, they're being upset right now because of the discovery of the shale fields, 
which are actually very close to the markets. So all the people who have some choice are really choosing to use the shale gas and not to use the pipeline. So some of the pipelines are facing a loss of their market. Some are converting their pipelines. Some people are converting pipelines to transporting oil instead, that kind of thing. The European system, if you look at it from uh, outer space, is pretty much the same, a whole bunch of long distance pipelines crossing, unfortunately, a number of smaller countries, but there you go. The gas tends to flow in the other direction from east to west and south to north. Um, we've got our own production in the North Sea and on land in Britain and the Netherlands here. That's declining a bit. Um, but there's the same idea, there's long distance <coughs> transport of gas from the producing areas, in this case largely in the east, to the consuming areas in the west. And nominally, at least, it's similar in that there's a big shale producing area which is also close to the market areas. But if you've been following, you'll know that Europeans have not been developing shale at anything like the rate that they've been developing it in the US um, for an all, all kinds of reasons, but a lot basically uh, political or environmental opposition to the fracking that goes on to produce it. So shale hasn't really taken off in Europe yet. Nevertheless, the pipelines themselves, the physical pipelines, look the same as US pipelines, or they would if you could see them, a lot of them underground. As far as company structure, uh, there are some differences, and I don't know quite where you would place New Zealand in this, but um, Europe started off with a very integrated system, basically sponsored by st the state governments. So transport, the, I'm talking about the long distance pipelines you saw on those maps, they are often integrated with the gas distribution networks. It's all one company sometimes, or there used to be one company. Until recently, they transported their own gas. They were vertically integrated in that they owned the pipelines and owned the gas that was transported through it. Uh, the third package, which came into force a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, has been forcing an unbundling of gas pipelines. So just recently, that's been, that's been separated out. Capacity, it, with the capacity within the pipelines is considered confidential information, commercially confidential. So it's quite hard to find out what the capacity is within the pipelines. And there's a, well, Jeff looking in from outside at least, I wouldn't like to say, he, say, he reckons that the companies, are pro, the companies are protected from rivalry. A lot of the regulatory systems are devo devoted to preserving the ro revenues of their mon regulated monopoly companies. So there's a general idea that there's a, um, if you've got a company, you're in, it shouldn't really be suffering too much competition from other people's uh, pipelines, especially since a lot of them are national champions. I mean, uh, you don't want the comp your national champion to be undercut by somebody else's pipeline if it's owned by another nation. That's not really the way we Europeans do things. In the US, however, there's another um, for a long time now, the transmission pipelines have been owned separately from the distribution networks. Uh, I think actually the Public, Public Utilities Holding Company Act, PUCA, was actually uh, repealed a few years back, but it had its effect. And so there's always been a strict division between the gas distributors and the gas transporters. And they actually um, form a kind of rivalry between them because the uh, they don't share the same interests. Since about the 1990s, pipelines have not been allowed to transport their own gas. The formal rule is that if a pipeline company owns gas, it has to sell it up, uh, upstream of its own pipeline. So they didn't take the gas away from the companies, but FERC, the US regulator, said they had to sell it before it reached their own pipeline. That was actually the mechanism used. So by selling it, they passed the gas on to a number of other competing companies. And sort of that sponsored competition. All the data is open. But in that book, Jeff makes a great deal of the fact that uh, it was a Supreme Court decision of 1912 that established if you're a public utility, then your accounts are public data. And you have to be made available. So all the information associated with the companies is public information. That includes capacity. So there's a lot of information on uh, websites about the 
capacity available at individual points in the network, not just entry and exit points like in Europe where they give a vague indication or traffic light signals or something. They have to specify exactly what's available at all points in the network. They're exposed to entry and basically that's to say it's a competitive industry. We'll see what it means, to how you do that in a minute. I'll explain what entry means in this context. But unlike the European system, which is a, recognizes a number of linked up monopolies, the American one has always been seen as a competitive industry with different pipelines competing to serve the same areas, same routes. As far as regulation is concerned, and again this will be less relevant to New Zealand where you've got one th authority, but the differences between regulation in the US and, and Europe are quite significant as well. Um, if we click down the differences, there are national the national regulators are correspond to the state regulators in the US and they do have these groups where they come together and coordinate their activities. But um, the big difference is that whereas in Europe the national authorities are finally responsible for regulating everything within their territory, there's no European level regulation. There are European directives but they actually operate on the member state governments. They bind the member state governments to, to adopt certain regulatory principles and then the regulation is carried out by the national regulators. In the states, although the state regulators look after gas distribution, they are not responsible for gas transport. So long distance transport is a federal subject and it's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and you've probably heard of the FERC, <coughs> that regulates all transport and it's always had this policy of promoting rivalry between different pipelines. So one of the big differences between the US and Europe is that there is a single authority that covers the whole of the gas market, if you like, that's responsible for regulating gas transport. Whereas in Europe, if we, to the extent we have a single European gas market, <coughs> the jurisdiction is broken up between lots of member states. Um, in the US, famously, all the regulators are ju quasi-judicial and independent of executive authorities. It's a bit difficult to maintain that in Europe. There is a requirement under the third package, these 2009 directives, that um, regulators should be independent of government. But if you look at some of the smaller countries in southern and eastern Europe, it's a bit difficult to see how that operates. Uh, often uh, regulatory decisions get overridden by political decisions or they're told what to do. And in fact, even the more powerful, you think the more responsible states of Northern Europe who pride themselves on their probity and transparency, you think they would pass this test, but they don't. Uh, the French government's forever overriding the decisions of its regulator to stop tariffs going up. And uh, even in Britain, there's been a lot of sabre rattling by our politicians trying to make the regulator do the right thing. I mean, threatening to abolish the regulator if they don't comply. So um, I can't claim any that we can we have clean hands in this respect, but certainly there's uh, not the same degree of independence in our regulators. It's a lot more politicized. Um, did I want to do that one? No, I was going to skip. I, some of those I was going to skip. I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. Okay. How does the US system work? Okay, there are some slides with words, and if you want to go and read the words later, feel free. There's just more explanation of the same thing. How does the US system work? Okay, I'm going to explain it with this one diagram um, in little pieces. And the key concept, which is mentioned at the top there, is Coasean property rights. Ronald Coase was an economist who died at age of 92 or something last year. But he set out the conditions for the successful creation of a market in something. And he said if you have a market, you basically have to define property rights and make them tradable. There's a number of things to do with that. What's a property right? A property right is something you have that other people can't use. It's, you can keep people out. So uh, That's not always possible. I and mean, if you think of an electricity grid, you might think you own a slice of the electricity grid, but you can't stop other people's electricity from passing down it. Whereas with gas pipelines, it basically, uh, not coast, but the, the US system basically defines capacity that belongs to the holder and can't be used by other people. So it's all about defining property rights on a pipeline. So what I've got here is a little picture 
with the gas coming from various sources at point A, running through B, C to D, where the recipients are the consumers. In the US, the recipients could be gas distribution networks, they might be power stations, or there might be the next pipeline along that then takes it to the next stage. In this pipeline, the thickness of the lines <coughs> represents the capacity that you've got. And so you can see in the middle between B and C, for historical reasons, say, there's a, a thin part, there's a constraint there. The pipeline doesn't have as much capacity to move gas from left to right as it does in the other parts. That might be because there used to be a gas field at C that was injecting gas here to feed these people. Now they need to bring it in from A. The Kosian system means that that capacity is covered by contracts. I'm going to represent that with these pretty little colored diagrams here, these rectangles. What that means is there are four contracts, blue, green, yellow, and orange. <coughs> and they match the capacity in the pipeline. So they actually, the, pipe, the contracts are point to point and they show how between B and C there is less capacity available than in, on the other parts of the pipeline. I hope that's clear. And those contracts, I'll talk in a minute about how they're designed, but they have to follow a standard pattern to reflect both the capacity and the cost conditions in the pipeline. That's what we mean by these Kosian property rights. They reflect the underlying asset. So that's where FERC enters the picture and regulates. It specifies how those contracts are defined, uh, defined and specified. So with that kind of a system, if people are trying to move gas from A to D, there's a constraint in the middle there, and that makes that middle section of the pipeline valuable. <coughs> the rest of it, they've got, people have contracts for it, but most capacity trades most of the time for almost nothing in the US. It's spare. It's it's just got no value. But that piece in the middle where there is a, a sh uh, lack of capacity, a constraint, gets a value, a scarcity value, a kind of a rental value. And the middle part of the capacity, so just this little part of the contract here, begins to trade at a price that's above zero, has some value in it. So what people do to respond to that is to create a new pipeline. If they see the value in the link between B and C, and just in that piece, what they really want to do is just to build an extra pipeline from B to C. And that's quite crucial, because when we talk about competing pipelines, sometimes people do talk about competing pipelines in Europe, they would mean if someone wanted to compete with this pipeline, then they would build a line all the way from A to D, because that's what it's competing with the whole pipeline. But the US system with these contracts defined by part makes it clear that only this part of the, the pipeline is valuable. And the regulatory system allows people to come in and build a loop just between B and C. You don't have to replicate the whole pipeline. So it's a lot more efficient than the European system. Those taps, that is where you join the pipelines onto the existing pipeline, uh, again, that's regulated. Every existing pipeline has an obligation to accept taps, to, make, make, to accept connections from other pipelines. That doesn't mean that anyone has a, um, they have an obligation to accept gas. I mean, they just have to accept, the guy will cut a hole in the side and connect his pipeline on. The actual right to flow gas, say, through this and come through here, is still dependent on these, on these contracts. But when they build this loop, they're filling in the capacity here, and you can see with the red bits and the contracts, the four, <coughs> four people who are holding capacity there also get a new contract for that additional capacity that matches what's underlying it. So every time a piece of capacity is added to the system, co contracts are issued that match the capacity. And the point is, which makes it different from Europe, is that Anybody can build this pipeline, and anybody can hold these contracts. There's no presumption that the existing pipeline owner would be the party responsible for making this investment. Anybody can come in and do it, because they just build a pipeline, connect it up to the existing pipeline, and issue contracts. And it's, it's issuing those contracts that gives them the ability to recover their costs. So the pipeline, the addition, is ordered by someone who wants the capacity and provided by 
anybody who's able to come in with a cheap offer. That's the way they preserve the competition. So in Europe, that would be regarded as an, sort of economies of scale, integrated with the network, difficult to unbundle, a reason for regulation and a monopoly case. But in the, in the US, they preserve the competition by making it possible for people to fit, for anyone to build that loop. And it's because everything is covered by contracts. What makes it work? Well, there are three sort of levels of efficiency that you have to uh, uh, achieve to make things work well overall. In at the stage where they're making the investment, you have open seasons and that obligation to provide taps. So anybody can say, I can see there is value in the link between B and C. So I'm going to build a pipeline if there's any demand. And they have an open season where they say, who would like to subscribe to capacity between B and C? And that enables a number of people to come together and the cap basically to capture the economies of scale in building a bigger pipeline rather than building little ones for each individual. So the four people in that example would come together and they would agree between them that they are going to pay for capacity from, from B to C. And the obligation to provide taps allows anybody to do this because they can come in and just link up their bit of pipeline to the existing pipeline. To make sure the pipelines are used efficiently, there is then regulation of tariff structures. <coughs> um, the contracts are all have to be point to point. They have to say wh what kind of capacity they're offering, where it comes from, where it goes to. And the charging structure is called straight fixed variable. That's the technical term for it. Um, you may know it by other terms, sometimes people just call it 90-10 or whatever, but basically the, f the fixed costs of building the pipeline are recovered through a fixed capacity charge and the variable costs of pumping the gas down the pipeline are recovered through a variable charge. So it's just a cost-reflective tariff. They have tried others. If you look at the history, the FERC's tried 50-50 and 60-40 and all kinds of other things, but they've settled on this straight fixed variable tariff structure, which reflects the underlying costs. Once you've got the pipeline and you've got people with access paying their contracts, one of the real concerns they have in Europe especially is that, that, that those people should not block other people from coming in and using the capacity if they would make more valuable use of it. And the same is true in the US. Those contracts, again, under a FERC, FERC requirement, are tradable. They all follow a standard format and they, they're tradable on the same basis throughout the United States. So any trader, any gas trader knows if he want, he could be set up anywhere, but knows if he wants to move gas anywhere in the US, if he goes out to buy capacity in the second-hand market, that contract will look the same wherever he goes. That's quite different from in Europe, where every nation has their own different arrangement. But they have, they have a common system throughout the US. So there's the unbundling of gas trading from pipelines, which keeps everything kind of free and above board and non-discriminatory, and then standard terms and standard trading platforms for the contracts. So a gas trader in the US is a guy with a desk and a phone who's done it a couple of times and knows what the contracts look like. He can then go out and buy gas in any market ca and capacity from there to where his customers are and it's all standard terms and conditions. So it's a pretty low margin business, to be honest. <coughs> um, I'm going to contrast that with the European system really just to give you a, uh, a little insight into obviously we dwell on this a bit more in Florence because it gives me a chance to say why our system is more crazy. Last time I did this I could see the organisers getting very nervous and trying to get me to shut up but I enjoy this bit. Um, this is a more, let's say it's a network. It's a, a couple of parts. It's not that different in structure actually from the American one I was talking about before but it, I had to make it a bit more complicated to show the problem. Here we've got uh, pipeline. Each of the arrows represents a pipeline with a capacity of 100. Um, it, gas flows through this link, but th there's 200 comes in here and 200 comes out here, so 100 has to flow across the middle from B to C. So it's just showing gas flows. And at peak times, you would expect this gas pipeline to be full, and that's what's happening here. Each of the flows matches the capacity in the pipeline, 100 or 200 as appropriate. Everything works just fine. Off-peak, the first thing that happens is demand I've got here dropping to 75% of the peak level. Okay, so 
all the customers have dropped their demand pro rata by 75% in this example. It's an example, not even Europeans are that coordinated. But, but the, the um, shippers, the suppliers of gas have decided they're going to maintain the flow, inflow of 200 at this point and to make up the rest that adds up to 225 of demand. So they're going to cut back demand, uh, inflow at E to only 25. And they might do that because this gas is subject to you know, uh, minimum take rules or maybe it's just cheaper, but they're just keeping it going. So what they've done is to economize on the more expensive or more flexible gas up here. And the trouble with that pattern is that although the total inflow matches the total outflow, to make it all balanced, you've got to bring 125 across the middle here and the capacity of that link is only 100. Now that can happen in a European network um, because th the capacities are defined at the entry and exit points and so are the tariffs, but they're not defined on a point-to-point -point basis or within the network. All you know is what the capacity is here and here, but they never give any information out about what's happening within the network. They call this system entry exit and the tariffs are based on that and the latest European directive creates an obligation to adopt that system as a standard system throughout Europe. So in other words, they want to hide what's going on within the network as an obligation. It seems a very odd approach really. I mean, I could give you a bit of reason why they adopted it, but it's not really, um, there's not much logic to it, not much economic logic to it. What happens in those conditions is that we call them TSO, Transmission System Operator, comes in and basically has to rebalance the system. They run a balancing market and essentially buys another 25 from the shippers at this point to bring their inflow up to 50 and sells it to the shippers there to drop their net inflow down to 175 and then it all balances out. So there's, there's a balancing role per performed by the system operator, which they can do in a number of ways. Um, it, it, sometimes they just withdraw capacity. They just tell the people, hey, sorry, we said we had 200, it's now 175. We just take the capacity away. Um, and then people have to bring in the gas from E. Uh, there's, uh, in the Swedish case, I'd say that it's an electricity grid. They, uh, they just <coughs> took the capacity away from foreigners. That seemed like a much easier thing to do. They took it away from the Norwegians and the Danes. That, that was electricity. But the, the Commission said, you can't do that anymore in the European Commission, in the European Union. And then sometimes they have a balance in market, they actually buy the gas formally from a shipper here, pay a price and sell it there for another price. And if there's a difference, they either make a profit or a loss and they pass that on to consumers. So the transmission system operator is basically then sorting out trade, for, sorting out the system by trading, which naturally substitutes for trading done by traders, those guys with the phones and the desk I was talking about, who would have to make these trades otherwise themselves. Which is one of the reasons why liquidity in the European market has never taken off, because the system operator is doing all the hard work for everybody. Which is, I think, one of the reasons why they got pushed into this system. But the difference between them, therefore, is in the institutions. Um, our, the European system, no one knows where the capacity is, no one knows how the balancing is taking place really. It's all, the, everything is pushed towards the system operators, whereas in the US it's all pushed back towards the traders and it's their responsibility. Um, in terms of institutional foundations, as Steve's already said, you can't just sort of pick up something and write the rules over it over here and take it because the, that American system requires quite a lot of underlying institutions and these are, well, some of them. Um, well, it's, it's privately financed, that's understood. Anyone can come in and finance the pipelines and everything is privately financed. Europe has a mixture of, of state financing, private financing and European subsidies for projects of common interest, which means projects that nobody wants to finance because they're not really any use. But uh, cross-border pipelines, that kind of thing. Vertical integration with distribution has been prohibited since 1935, so the people who are buying those pipeline contracts are actually the distribution companies. The distribution companies are their customers in the US system. 
um, accounting and said there's been no commercial secrets, no, nothing secret since 1912. There's a strong federal jurisdiction. That the Commerce Clause <coughs> of the US Constitution doesn't actually talk about gas pipelines because it was written in 1787, but it does say that cross-border, uh, not cross-border trade, interstate commerce is the American phrase, falls under the jurisdiction of the federal authorities. And long distance gas transport has been regarded as interstate commerce since the beginning of the gas industry. And then the pipelines being pushed out of the gas commodity business, the unbundling that finally took place during the 1990s, not through a formal regulation or rule, but through a number of um, decisions taken by FERC on particular cases, making it clear that that had to happen. So it, it was a process that they went through rather than an individual decision. <coughs> but all of those come together, along with all of the regulatory institutions. Um, this, just, just this pyramid for the US and is matched in Canada, which is only interesting because the Canadian gas system is completely integrated with the US gas system and actually operates on the same basis, despite having no US constitution to rely on. But it has a similar set of institutions and therefore can operate in a similar fashion. So these institutions you need, there's a, the foundation, those principles that, and the, the constitutional amendments, everyone knows the Fifth Amendment, it's not about remaining silent. As if you read on, it talks about uh, no, um, no taking without due process which is the protection of property. And that was the basis then for these Supreme Court cases in 1923 and 1920, 1944, which established that utility accounts define what property you have, which can't be taken from you by a regulatory process. So it gave investors some security over their investment. When you made an investment, once it's accepted into the accounts, it becomes property and is therefore protected by the Constitution. The Administration Procedures Act and the Canadian equivalent are just really saying that how regulatory decisions are taken, they have to be based on evidence. It's a quasi-judicial process, so there's always an explanation of the decision or you can complain. Accounts have been set up um, essentially from 1938, I think it was, they, the association first did that. And uh, that means that everyone has understood for a long time what the accounts mean and how they're collected and there's no d arguments over those. And then you have a, ju a judiciary that looks after the appeals process so the Americans understand how that works. They can all hire a lawyer when they need one. And then the rate making is case by case, it's all individual. But actually FERC, I spoke to someone at FERC recent, oh, a year or two ago who'd been responsible for gas transmission and she admitted they hadn't done a, for a review of gas transmission tariffs for about a decade because they just hadn't felt the need. It was operating fine without FERC intervening. Um, I think we can skip through some of these wordy slides. Uh, but it had, the point there is really that after that transition in 2000, up to 2000, where the um, unbundling took place, things have been pretty stable since then. Whereas the European system, to be honest, is still in turmoil. Uh, we've had the third package, which is 2009. Third package meaning a number of directives to create the internal energy market. Uh, occasionally we mumble something to people about needed for a fourth package. And the European regulators and bureaucrats all look very nervous about that. They really don't want the, like the idea of having to go around this whole thing again. But the system we have is really not yet stable. And still, there are still problems. Um, so there, there will be a fourth package at some point in the future. What are the consequences of all of that? Well, uh, in Europe, we still have a concern about market power. Um, there are lots of problems with gas contracts and old contracts left behind. There are oil-linked gas contracts, and if our marginal source of gas is essentially Russia, which insists on setting prices by reference to the oil price. So that holds up the price of gas in Europe. There are lots of take-or-pay provisions, but they don't have those in the United States. Take-or-pay provisions are minimum take or minimum quantities to be consumed each year, so a source of inflexibility. There has been a big effort to get rid of this, but there, for a long time there will be a prohibition on resale. And Anyone who's got any knowledge of competition policy will know that's a no-no as far as competition policy is concerned. But the gas contracts 
would often have a specified point of delivery, and so you couldn't then transfer that to gas anywhere else, which restricted competition. And there is still a lack of forward markets. They go out a little bit, but the volumes are very small. Um, the UK has a, a forward market people can trade in, but the volumes are much lower than in the, the US, where it's just huge. Some of the problems you have over the pipelines are redundant pipelines, extra pipelines being built where none is ne needed, um, certainly no comp competitive pressure. And there, there are still, despite the three packages that I talked about, the open access arrangement, there are still difficulties getting access to existing pipelines. It's not an easy business. The immediate consequence is uh, our gas price. Let's see. I was a bit surprised about this one. Did it? The US and Canada, <coughs> are these prices down here, very low prices for gas. These are the European ones, including the UK, which is often thought of as a competitive, relatively competitive market by European standards. So, whereas the US one, well, it's down there, it says only two dollars an MB, B, MMBTU. I think it has been higher. Uh, in the U, in the UK, we're paying ten dollars an MMBTU. We're not quite so bad off as Japan that's paying 16, but um, that is, as you know, that's probably for temporary reasons to do with the closure of their nuclear plants. They're desperate for gas at the moment. Um, but it's, it's the big question is why there should be such a difference between the European, UK, and German prices, the European prices, and the American and Canadian prices. This is really just a more detailed version of the US prices. They're dri dribbling along at this level, which, as you can see, is now unrelated to oil prices. That, I don't know whether that's a surprise here or not, but it's a, in Europe, there are still a lot of people who regard the oil price as the natural level to which the gas price should rise. And in fact, it does in Europe. The gas, price in, gas prices in Europe still track oil prices fairly closely, although it's a bit difficult to find out exactly why. I think it may just be that the marginal source of gas is these Russian contracts which are oil indexed. What are the consequences? Well, yes, in Europe we have no real gas, no, I say no gas market, you can go to them but there's nobody else there when you turn up. I mean, there's a very limited volume of gas trading in most places. There's some spot trading, no real forward, not a no liquid forward market, even the UK forward market has its problems. In the US, there's been a huge gas market for years, and it's a very liquid market with great, high, very high volumes. Um, in Europe, there's no real liquid market of inland <coughs> gas transport capacity either, which means if you want to make a short-term deal to move gas from one place to another, it's quite difficult to negotiate access over the intervening pipelines. You basically have to negotiate um, to pay a tariff to each of the, each of the companies in between. But in the US, it's you just go out and buy these second-hand contracts in an open market. One of the current themes in the in European gas industry is what, how can we reduce our reliance on Russia because our system is very much dominated by supplies from Russia. And uh, interestingly, that's not being competed away by supplies coming from other places. Um, partly that's because getting access to the grid to the networks and the pipelines in Europe is so difficult, so we're stuck with Russia. Um, my colleague Jeff Macom assures me that the situation in the US is quite different in that they're not at all worried about the Canadians. <laughs> Sorry, these little red buttons down here just tell me that I can skip some of the slides. I think I'm going to end. There's a couple more slides on consequences for Europe, which I'll spare you. But basically, to sum up uh, what you can see from looking at the US system is that uh, you can construct a system. That they have constructed a system in the US where gas pipelines are provided on a competitive and cost-based basis. Those open seasons allow you to shop around for pipeline capacity and make sure you get the best price, which is basically the cost of building the little loops that we saw in that picture. It's separate from commodity sales, but there is a vibrant market in both. You can stitch together a deal with gas in one place and second-hand capacity between places very easily. 
distribution networks are separate from the trunk pipelines from the high pressure pipelines. That's uh, important, not sort of um, institutionally, but it creates a dynamic. It means that there is uh, a, there's some counterforce to the gas pipelines in the US, uh, someone who wants to drive prices down. And that's partly because they are regulated by state regulators who want to keep prices down independently from the regulation of the, ga the transport pipelines by FERC. So there's a separate set of interests within the industry. To make it all work, you need to put together all those institutions that were in that pyramid and so forth. So it's quite a complicated task, but essentially you need transparency over the capacity so people can see that the contracts match the capacity. You need some regulatory accounts that define costs on an unambiguous basis. You need some, well in our case, EU regulators that will defend property rights. That would be nice. There aren't any of those around. I've never found a definition of property rights in European law or any kind of protection of them. Um, part and parcel of defining those contracts is to define the capacity from point to point. And the entry-exit system we have kind of mushes all that together. It hides the capacity within the network, so you'd have to be disaggregated. <coughs> and uh, this last point, pipeline capacity additions are subject to incremental pricing. Um, that was a big battle in the U.S. that went on for about 10 years. So it was, the question was, if a pipeline builds an, a new piece of capacity, do they charge the users of that the incremental cost of that piece of capacity, or do they do what they call rolled-in pricing, which is to charge an average tariff that puts all the costs into one pot and averages them out over the existing customers and the new ones. And the, for a long time, FERC was flipping backwards and forwards between rolled-in pricing and incremental pricing. <coughs> but after, again, about 10 years of battles, they uh, agreed on the incremental pricing, which is the system that's consistent with those Kosian property rights. <coughs> so when people buy something, they buy a real thing and they pay the cost of that thing, not the cost of something else. It also means that the existing customers are saved from any cost increases that arise because somebody else has asked for new capacity. So you put all those together and you've got the US system with all its underlying institutions and I think it's interesting experience because what it shows is that you can separate out gas and transport markets, that's okay, but both can be kept competitive. I think that's the triumph of the US system is that it not only obviously has a competitive gas market, they're ten a penny these days more or less, but they've managed to preserve competition in the gas pipeline sector and I think that would be a great thing if Europe could do it. I offer it to you for your own education. Whether you want to pick it up, I leave to you. Okay. Steve. Excellent. All right, thank you, Graham. Now, is this microphone going to work? Good. Graham, are you happy to take a few questions? Sure. As I said, there's a, whilst across the world, and if you've been like me, you've been sitting there saying, gee, that's very similar, that's totally different. How would that work is the way my brain's been working. So who would like to dot down on an aspect of that and ask a question. Uh, uh, Stephen, welcome. Oh, now I, I have to give you this microphone <coughs> because with the new technology they won't hear you otherwise. <coughs> Stephen Gale from the Commerce Commission. Does the UK have the same uh, duplication of long distance gas pipelines that seems to be crucial <coughs> in the US? Uh, no, there's one company, the, I mean National Grid Gas now runs the whole thing and it, they tend to um, discourage the building of onshore gas pipelines. What people do instead is to build offshore gas pipelines. You remember that the North Sea is right next to Britain and it's subject to a different regime, much more like the US one. It doesn't have quite the same restrictions. It doesn't have the same requirement for unbundling, for example, because it's basically done by joint ventures of gas producers who get together and build their own capacity, build their own pipelines to bring the gas on shore. But a couple of times people have chosen to build pipelines down the middle of the North Sea rather than build them on land because it was so much easier and cheaper. Mm. Most people thinking. <coughs> Jeremy. Um, I mean, we've heard a lot about how good the American system is. 
what's not good about it? From whose point of view? I mean, from an from economic point of view. Yeah, from your point of view. Well, you see, from an economic point of view, it's pretty good because it does this Kosian thing of saying, here's the, the nature and the cost of the underlying asset. Let's reflect those in the contract. Let's have a market. So that's, that's why it's sort of a good, good trick economically to pull off if you can do it. What's bad about it? Um, I know from talking about this in the UK that some of the customers rather like the idea that they can avoid signing a long-term contract. They don't like making the commitment to get the capacity. They'd rather, if they build a power station, they'd rather know that they can close down the power station and walk away and not be stuck with a long-term contract for capacity. In practice, if you had that kind of a market, you would be able to sell it on to somebody else or some part of the capacity would be usable by somebody else. But I know a lot of people dislike the idea of having to make the long-term commitments. In the US, those long-term commitments are made by gas distribution businesses, mostly in the Northeast, where we saw where the market is. They need gas for winter heating load. The power stations need gas mostly for summer air conditioning supply. And so what happens is the gas distribution networks commission the pipelines and pay for the capacity in the first place. And then the power stations buy the capacity secondhand in the summer when it's basically available for nothing because it's spare. <coughs> So in the, the U.S. has this fortuitous set of conditions where the gas and the electricity people fit together nicely because their seasonal pattern of demand is different. In Britain, everything peaks in the winter, so that wouldn't work so well. That's why the power stations would have to go out and pay for capacity or take their chances. And I know that they feel reluctant to do that. Uh, Graham, um, the slide on oil price in connection with um, gas, gas prices um, seems to sort of create the impression that the American market is somehow, um, because of what you see here, able to lead to more kind of com competitive gas prices. But in a way, that's related to the specific circumstances of the American gas market, particularly in the last you know two three years. Yeah. So what do you Partly. see? Yeah. What do you see as that sort of connection between price, let's say, for consumption generally and oil markets? It just strikes me that um, in a way, just saying it's linked to oil markets or not, as the case may be, is not a good way of sort of describing the relationship between oil and gas prices. Yeah, the, the link is, I mean, a bit more complicated than just here's one system and the price is low and here's another and the price is high. The US system, the, the recent developments you're talking about, the shale gas production, which led to a massive surplus of gas and caused the price to collapse. I mean, you can see it in the diagram. Um, page up, page up, page up, page up, page up. Uh, let me have natural gas. Yeah. I mean, you can see the effect of the shale gas coming in from 2009 onwards when um, before then they had these spikes. Some of it was to do with uh, Hurricane Katrina down there on the left-hand side causing a shortage of gas. And this is the boom driving up the cost of gas supplies generally kind of in a peak. But from 2009 onwards, you've got the shale gas developments pushing it down. But that development of shale gas is not independent of what I've been talking about. The fact that any wildcatter can go out, stick a hole in the ground and start exploding whatever they do down the bottom of the <coughs> hole is based on the, their uh, knowledge that they can then stick a pipe, uh, um, build a pipe and stick it into the neighboring pipeline very easily and gain the access very cheaply and easily to get their gas out of the ground. One of the reasons, I mean there are a lot of reasons why shale gas is not taking off in Europe and why our prices are still up at the at the top end here. One of them is that there are very few people prepared to go and invest in shale gas, even if they're allowed to, which is not always true, because they know that they then have to, you know, when they get the gas, they'll have to negotiate with a local pipeline and pay a tariff, which is a bit difficult to um, anticipate. It could change at any time. 
They keep changing the structure of the tariffs. How much you'd have to pay for bringing gas in at that particular point is not known. Could, if you're competing with the integrated business, to some which less and less, but there are still some places where that's a problem, then you just know you're going to get hit with a big tariff. So there are lots of problems associated with that structure to do with tr the access to the pipeline. That means other people are not trying to develop the shale gas. Now, if you look up in Poland, for example, uh, the, Poland's got the big shale gas deposits, they think, and is desperate to develop the shale gas to reduce its reliance on Russia. But the only people that are developing it are the, is, is PGNIG, the local uh, incumbent monopoly. Nobody else is going around developing shale gas. Now that, that kind of um, combination of events is, is <coughs> complex. A part of the problem is that they just, our system is just not the same open access e or easy access arrangement that they have in the US that allows anybody in, including two-bit little businesses with a you know, drill and a, a hard hat and that's all it takes. Um, subsidiary question, Neil Walbrand. Um, is, would it be feasible for the UK and European pipeline industry to have some degree of competition from US LNG exporters? Um, yes, but not much. I know that because NERA has studied that for the um, US government. At the moment, there is... Uh, a restriction on the export of gas from the US. That's one of the reasons why the price is so low. It's, it's not that there are no exports, it's you have to get a permit to be allowed to export. And so there were questions about whether they should issue permits for the export of the gas. Um, the obvious effect would be to raise the price. And so the question is, what does that do to the US economy as a whole? And we have a guy who has a model, a macroeconomic model of the US economy, actually the global economy. <coughs> with a specific energy sector. And he looked at that question for the Department of Justice, I think it was. looking, And it won't surprise you, you know, free trade is a good thing. So it, the general results were that the US overall would be better off by allowing exports. The profits might be captured by the gas producers and, and some other people would lose out, but overall the, the, it would benefit. But what he found was that there wasn't much potential for export from the US to Europe because the price difference is actually not that large compared to the costs of uh, cooling it, to liquefaction, transport and regasification. Um, and just made the point to me that no one in their right mind would in make all those investments in LNG facilities to transport gas, it's a long-term investment, but to transport gas into a European market where the price is held up by institutional, for institutional reasons, where there's no shortage of gas, but the price is temporarily or whatever held up for institutional reasons. Exactly, yeah. You just know the price is going to collapse very quickly if you bring in the gas in. So it, it, the feeling is there won't be a lot of transatlantic trade. What might happen is it's more worthwhile taking the gas out to Asia because at least for some time <coughs> it's worth capturing <coughs> this price even if it drops back to this one later, that's still worthwhile doing. So given the choice, it looks like the gas will go out the western side of the United States and across the Pacific, rather than across the eastern, out the eastern side and across the Atlantic. What about exporting as methanol rather than LNG? I've not heard that discussed. <coughs> okay, other questions? By the way, if the gas doesn't go out through the US at all, it may go out through Canada. That's one of the <laughs> possibilities. The Canadians may just become the exporters for North America. Hi, Ross Dixon from Corgo. I just um, wondered a lot of the discussion and comparison in the markets is, a, is about price and so on, which you'd expect in economics. But another big factor is the reliability of those systems or and availability and um, I just wonder if there's any comparison being done between the two regimes with regard to of. responding to failures and responding to security or supply issues. Who's, who's looking after that? Uh, it all works fine, as far as I understand. <laughs> 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 to quote Jeff, if hell froze over and no gas came out, nobody would notice for three days. 
you know, it's just not, the gas system in the US is such long distance and such slow moving that a fault on some part of the system has a tiny impact on the rest of it. So they don't have a problem with the reliability. The only problem they had was, um, uh, wrong way, sorry. This, this spike here is 2005. Hurricane, Tr Hurricane Katrina took out the Henry Hub. The, the, all the gas production in the offshore in the Gulf of Mexico was, was wrecked by Hurricane Katrina, so they had a problem there. We were, but that's the Henry Hub price, that's the local price. People then just took gas out of storage until they got the production back up together again. Well, I'm, I'm going to jump in with one while I can. Uh, you, you touched briefly on the spot markets and the forward markets. Now that's of interest <coughs> to us because Mary Jane, we're coming up one year on New Zealand's first trading wholesale market platform. So we're interested in how you develop a healthy market and keep it going. What's going on in Europe that that's not happening and what, what would, is there anything you pluck out and say to produce healthy markets, do you do this? Um, yeah, there is. I mean, it's, um, there, are, there are lots of <coughs> points to make about gas markets in Europe and why they're not taking off and to, to do with lack of transparency and the fact that people have contracts that cover all their needs and have flexibility built into them so people don't need to trade, whereas in, certainly in the UK, where there's a bit more trading, people sign contracts for a fixed volume, so they're, they're trading to match patterns. But the, the point I was making here was that the, when there's a problem on the network here, the system operator steps in to resolve it. Whereas in the US they would not do that, and so to get to this position where only 175 is coming in here and a full 50 is coming in here, somebody has to go in and the guy who's got the gas here has to sell it, get rid of it and buy gas here. So the US system is structured to require more trading than the European system because the system operators are not doing that thing of balancing the networks on behalf of traders. I said there wasn't much rationale to the European system, but the reason why that system emerged was because we started off with incumbent, often state-owned national monopolies, and if you were having to make those kind of trades to rebalance your own gas portfolio, wherever you went, just about the only person you could trade with was that incumbent state-owned monopoly, who was any guy with the gas everywhere. So they set this system up as a way of favouring new entrants and uh, relieving them of the burden of having to trade, as you would here, with the incumbent state monopoly. But we've still got that system in place and all it means is there is no trade because they created a system that didn't require it or required less of it. Yeah. Any other questions? It's brilliant. I've actually got one more. Um, you've touched on sort of the, f you've talked about the um, scenarios for investment. Just think about new pipes and of course that's right because a lot of new gas, shale gas and so on, potential for more. The flip side, stranded assets but that's the flip side of the investment story. Um, is, is there a theme emerging in Europe or, or the US that says how investors have to deal with the realities of stranded assets? Or is that um, a, a not a current theme? Well, in the US, there's no such thing because when they issue those contracts, the little red blocks that I talked about, the, those new contracts are long-term contracts recover the full cost of that investment. So somebody is on the hook to pay for those pipelines, or at least pay the cost of building those pipelines over their whole lives. When you come to the end of the contract, there are often arguments over who has the right to the pipeline capacity from that point onwards. And that's been the, the way it's worked in the past because the pipeline capacity was valuable. Um, and the question is, does it belong to the pipeline because there's no longer a contract, or does the contract give you the right to extend indefinitely? I mean, they just have an argument about that in the courts. You know, it's, not, it's no big deal. Recently, with the shale gas, that's turned around, and when contracts have come to the end of their contracts, suddenly nobody wants to renew any contracts at all. And there was a big dispute, actually, in Canada, the Trans-Alberta pipeline, with um, the pipeline company trying to reallocate the costs of those, some unrecovered costs, apparently, 
of those pipelines, reallocate them back onto other customers in other parts of the system. And Jeff was <laughs> involved in maintaining the purity of the economic transaction by making sure that didn't happen. So he was, there was, in a, again, a, a legal dispute over that. So yeah, people have been trying to find ways to, if they have got unrecovered costs, Trans-Alberta was trying to stick them on some other ir unrelated customers, but was prevented from doing that by the courts. Thank you. All right, any th last thoughts? Otherwise, if, if I could say, I think that's the questions <coughs> have demonstrated, Graham, exactly what I wanted, which is just, you know, where do we plug into this and what lessons can we learn from overseas? So that's really excellent. So really has achieved the purpose I wanted to today, and I think you're going to send us away thinking about a whole bunch of stuff. Um, if you want to know more about what Graham's been saying recently, I just note that uh, yes, there's some blog things he did with Graham Hancock, which are up on energy. John Hancock. John. John Hancock. Not, John Gra not Graham Hancock. That's right, John, John Hancock. Yeah. We know him well. John, you're not here today, no. Uh, but also he's spoken recently at the ACCC conference, and I think that presentation's up on screen and accessible as well on different topics, more to do with retail electricity markets, if I've got it right. But he's got a broad spread of interests. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask you to join me in thanking Graham for slotting down with us today and, and offering us those thoughts. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.